today for this uh, conversation with Justin Dewar. I'm Allison Amick, curator here at Intuit, and I had the pleasure of working with uh, Justin on this exhibition. I know we have many uh, supporters of Justin's work here, including some of our board members, exhibition committee members, Suzanne, and our chair, Matt Ariant, who was uh, really responsible for bringing Justin's work to our attention. And so we're so happy to have you both and all of you here today. So Justin is a Philadelphia-based artist, musician, and writer, and into its exhibition features selections from his scroll cycle as well as other independent uh, drawings that he has made over the years. He works uh, primarily in pen and marker, and this is the first time that the scrolls have been on view outside of Philadelphia, so we're very excited to have them here at Intuit. And so we'll get started with a few questions, and then at the end we'll open it up to the audience for a brief uh, Q&A. And so, Justin, you grew up in rural uh, Pennsylvania, always had an interest in art and drawing, and ended up moving to Philadelphia to pursue your interest in music, but yet you also did continue uh, to draw as well. And so in working on this, uh, exhibition, you came across this uh, this early photo of you from the mid 1990s. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, to say I moved from rural PA um, to Philly to pursue music is somewhat true, um, but really it was to escape rural Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, as a wayward kid from that part of the world. Um, as, as I'm sure, you know, you might be able to imagine. Um, you know, I had a pretty hard time um, in school and stuff. And so, um, around midway through 11th grade, I dropped out of high school. I got kicked out of art class in high school in like 10th grade. Um, because? <laughs> <they're>, <coughs> the reasons are actually, um, if I was being interviewed with Howard Stern, he may needle me about this. And, um, you know, but uh, the reasons are complex. Um, essentially, uh, you know, I believe there was a conspiracy involved. Um, I won't go into it, but I w all to say, it doesn't really matter. Um, I felt like I had to get out of there, you know, and I had a couple of friends who were musicians and stuff. I had a friend who was like, I'm gonna, you know, I was hanging out with the wrong, the wrong crowd, you know, whatever, the kids that smoked pot and the metalheads and whatever, and, and I was one of them. So, you know, we were, and we were, God, how old we were 17 or whatever we were. So it was like this fantastical notion that we got from reading magazines or something like, go to Philly and, you know, the band will take off and like, you know, whatever. Um, and of course the band didn't take off and um, we all ended up, you know, we pretty quickly met other homeless teenagers or whatever and it was like, you know, I remember this one kid trying to convince me to move to New York because he was like, in New York, you can huff Freon, you know? Like, you can, there's Freon freely available on rooftops and you can huff Freon and jump across rooftops, so you, can, you should move to New York, you know? And it wasn't enough of an inducement, you know? But this was a place in 1994 after we, uh, we subletted a frat house the, uh, for, for three months in the summer for like $200 a month and then our money ran out and then we were living in abandoned buildings and stuff. And this was a hotel, previously, formerly a hotel in Philly, that at some point, I think in the mid-80s or late 80s, the, the top floors had caught on fire and some people perished in the fire. And then we, we made an entranceway on the basement so you could, we put hinges on it, so you could push in the hinges and go into the boiler room and we'd use candles to go through the boiler room and go up the stairs and it was haunted and spooky. And this was like, we had a kerosene heater, and it was a it was freezing cold that winter in '94. There was a big ice storm and stuff, and we had a kerosene heater, and you'd start to run out of oxygen, and so you'd open the window, but then you'd get cold. So then you close the window, and so it was like a constant back and forth between like breathing oxygen or freezing. Like, which do you want to do more? You know. Um, and uh, but I began this big drawing on the wall of that abandoned hotel. Um, because we had all this time to spend in there, especially in the winter, and I would steal magic markers from the gas station that was like a block away, and um, and hot dogs too, which we got horrible food poisoning, but that's another story. Um, but I started doing this big, big, big drawing, because I was like, oh, I'll do this big drawing and cover the whole wall, um, 
and I got a lot further. I can't believe I found this photo. I can't believe there's a photograph of it. It was a high school friend of one of my other friends who happened to come down to the city for a few days, and he was taking a photography course in school or something, and he took a few pictures, and it miraculously survived. Um, but that drawing got a lot bigger over time. It, it ended up filling the whole wall. Then eventually they knocked the hotel down. Um, they demolished the hotel, and when that happened, we were on the third floor, I believe, and the plaster got, remained stuck to the bricks. So there was like this big mural up on the third, you know, like up on a wall, like a billboard. Um, and it was the first time other people, aside from me and my like two friends, had seen the drawing. And I remember people telling me, oh, you know, people take pictures of that thing. You know, and I was like, no shit, really? People take pictures? And then I stood there and I'd watch people go by and eavesdrop on them, and I'd see people stop and be like, okay, that, that's crazy. Because people do that with, um, spray can graffiti, like they'll go into abandoned buildings, you've seen that, you know what I mean, they'll go into and, and do something up on the fifth floor, and it's impressive, because it's high up, and it's bold, and you think it's extra bad and bold, because you just think, oh yeah, they had to go in there somehow and stuff, but this had a different element, because it obviously took months to do the piece of art, so it wasn't like, oh, somebody went in there and spent six hours doing a really good, you know, like, fool, you know, with crazy lettering and stuff, it was like, oh, this must have taken like three months, and it's like, stuck to the plaster, you know, so um, it boosted my ego a little bit as regards my art, you know, because my, my um, belief in myself with art was very low at that point, coming from my previous experiences. I like doing it, but, you know, um, but seeing the people stop and be like, did you see that thing? You know, it's like, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> That's a, I don't know. Yeah. And then, uh, so around that time, too, you were also working a series of uh, odd jobs here and there, including a stint on a, a fishing boat in the Bering Sea, and you had a vision at some point on that ship. Yeah, that was um, so that was a big life-changing event for me uh, around 1995. Yeah, I went up and worked on these fishing boats in the Bering Sea. My friend Kevin O'Brien, um, who was bought from Boston originally, you know, and, and he was. Uh, always up to some crazy thing or the other, like, I don't even, I have no idea how he found out about this job, but he's like, I was working as a foot courier for this kangaroo couriers, making way less than minimum wage because they paid you on commission, and it was like, oh, you get a dollar if you deliver a package, and we lost our license to have bicycles because the guy who was the, um, who was the boss was a, I never read any of those Jack Kerouacs, but I just know he was right out of one of those Jack Kerouac things. Like, he'd always have a bottle of flask of whiskey on his desk, and he's got this, like, little stubby beard, you know, and, he, and he's like, yeah, kid, I'll tell you what, here's six dollars, you know, great day. So, um, but and, uh, that job was like, I was like, well, I can sort of pay into this group warehouse situation I'm living in, but, like, I don't know, maybe it's time to just start to cut my losses and go back to living in some place like the hotel or something, you know. And then my friend Kevin O'Brien was like, oh, he's like, dude, you're going to make so much money. You make like $30,000. You go out and it's, you know, and I'm like, all right, I'm in. You know, like we're, you know, we'll go to the Bering Sea and work on these fishing boats. And so we did that, me and a couple of friends of mine. And, um, you know, it wasn't quite as glorious as he <laughs> made it out to be. Um, we excelled at it, though. We all excelled at it because we're like, the, the work day was 17 hours. And then, and then every once in a while you'd have to do a 50 hour day and you'd come back on and start your 17 hour shifts again. But they fed us. We we're like, it's like easy street. You know, it's like you get all the food you want to eat and they, you have a bunk, you know, as long as the other guy's not sleeping in it. We did this, it's illegal, but we did that hot bunking. You know, you're like, wake up, my turn, you know, sleep for four hours. Somebody, wake up, my turn. You know? um, we had one bathroom for 90, 90 people in the crew. You know? um, but, you know, um, to me, it was easy street in a lot of ways, you know what I mean? It was like, well, as long as you keep your head down and you do your work, nobody's going to bully you and, you know, whatever. But a lot of people would go crazy, like this, you know, from the, from the, what do they call that? Sensory deprivation and the repetition, the repetitious nature of the work. Um, some people go so crazy that they could, they'd get fired, and then you get majorly penalized. This guy Arlen, like, I, I felt bad for him, you know, because he got bullied a lot, because that toe the line saying, like, so people would pick on you, like, if you're not doing good enough because everybody else would be like, oh, now we got to do more. So it was like, it wasn't like prison culture, but it was because there was work to do and it was everybody was there to make money. It was like they were, they wanted to be there, but um, it would get a little bit like that sometimes when somebody was like messing up, you know what I mean? So, and it was, it was bad to see, but um, 
I never had anything like that. Like this guy Arlen, he like ended up stabbing the captain of this other boat and all that stuff like that. And he thought demons were in the men's machine. And I got along with him after that because I, I didn't pay him too much mind. And then he'd, he'd come in the factory and be like, Justin, I'm wearing a helmet. You want to wear a helmet? And like, hook me up. Let's wear helmets, you know? And then the factory foreman would be like, don't be humor in Arlen. You know, like, what are you doing? You know, it's like, um, but, uh, I, but I had one where I was like working with my driver partner, Yaya. Um, and he, he taught an African drumming class in Seattle. I like the idol. We used to play the drums on the machines when the machine would break, you know. Um, but I was, I was working there, um, and this thing, driving, by the way, is when fish fall down, you put them on a conveyor belt really fast, and you got to flip them all the right way. So it's almost like playing the drums or something, and you do it for 16 hours, and you get in this zone, you know, and I was like deep, 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 deep in this zone, you know. And um, I had this feeling like there was all this light coming from behind me like lifting me up, like it was like this weird, and, and I'm not, you know, it's not one of those things like, oh, it's, you know, I didn't put a certain name on it or something, I mean, I didn't have like a, um, you know, a, a, at the time, and, and still pretty much, you know, kind of, kind of like an agnostic in respect to, you know, spirituality and stuff, but so I wasn't, I didn't have some sense of like, oh, it's this deity or that deity, but I was, I was like really like, whoa, this must be what people are talking about when they talk about that type of stuff, because, I mean, it was weird, you know? And, um, yeah, it was this enveloping light sort of experience, and uh, it gave me a feeling like, I, it's hard to put into words, but it gave me a feeling like, well, I guess I can put it into words. It gave me a feeling like if you get obliterated or whatever, you know, it's still okay. You know, it's like some guardian angel kind of stuff, you know what I mean, where it's like, you know, it's whatever, whatever happens, it's, you know, not, there's nothing that can happen to you that's really gonna be as bad as you think it is when you're alive. You know what I mean? That during life you think like, oh, you know, what if this happens and what if that happens? And it's kind of this bigger perspective of like, well, there's this much larger perspective where it's like, you know, um, so that, plus I got some money from that job. <laughs> you know, I came back to Philly and I had a, yeah, I made more money other seasons. I think that season I ended up with eight thousand bucks or something. But that was enough money to be like, okay, I'm set. Like, you know, I can, I can do other stuff with my life. And I, and I also had that kind of like balm of, you know, spiritual uplift or whatever the heck that was about. You know, so um, that kind of like was a big changing point. You know, um, and I yeah, I started to get more into the art too because I had time. Right, you had the because you said you were maybe three months on, three months mm -hmm. off, and so during your uh, months off, you were able to focus on the art uh, right. while you were working. And so at that point, you had begun some of the work that became part of this series, mm -hmm. Scrolls? Yeah, that was, um, yeah. And we're seeing the first three from the cycle on the screen, uh, just for reference. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the first three, although, I didn't start connecting them until, until later. later. So the middle one was actually from like 2007 or something. But yeah, that one's from 99 and that one's from probably like 2001 or something like that, yeah. So talk a little bit about the scrolls and how you got the idea uh, and how they evolved or how you began to yeah. decide to connect them, for example. Well, I started drawing these ones probably just on a big piece of paper or something. I can't remember exactly, but you know, it was kind of inspired by the hotel, the abandoned hotel drawing because I thought like, oh, you know, if you just do these big, really detailed pen drawing, it's like kind of undeniable, you know, because people always want to deny everything, you know, it's like if you do a little drawing and no matter how good it is, people will be like, yeah, I mean, so well, I've seen it, you know how people are, they're cynical, I've seen it all before, you know, so people always want you to show them something they've never seen before, and I thought, you know what people have never seen before, if I really blow it up, you know, if it's like that, <laughs> and, and I did that on the hotel one, and so I, I was, um, I had more time to work on my art because I had a couple of months in between the seasons and stuff to draw. And, and money too, so I didn't have to work any other jobs. So it's weird because you do this intense burst of like physical dangerous labor and stuff and then you're like, quiet now, you know? Um, so you have this reflective you know, time in between. And um, yeah, I started doing that one. It's funny because I started drawing that on the wall. I pinned a piece of paper up on the wall and then somebody was like, I was like, man, I'm getting wrist cramps, you know? And they're like, dumbass, I mean, why don't you put it on the floor? You know? And I was like, yeah, oh. put it on the floor. <laughs> Way easier. Like, I've never, it's like, I draw everything on the floor. And some people are like, how do you draw on the floor? I'm like, you sit on the floor and draw it. I mean, and you won't get a wrist cramp if you draw on the wall like that. It's like, really, like, 
I guess they have those little things you can put, you know what I mean? Those, they steady yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think in ancient Egypt they did that. I think I've seen drawings of the people in ancient Egypt on the mural. You know, and they have the, well, because they grid it out too, because they're blowing up things bigger. I wasn't doing that, but um, anyways, I started doing these and I, I eventually got a pretty good bunch of them. This is like long after the fishing boats. I had, you know, 15 of them or something like that because I would just draw them periodically. And then my roommate at the time, Seth, he was like, somebody came over to visit us one day. Um, and I, he, was like, he was like, you know, I forget who it was visiting him, but you know, he's like, oh yeah, you should, you know, you should show Natalie or whatever your, um, your big drawings, you know, and something like showing them and you know, whoever came over to visit is like, oh, these are great, you know? And, and Seth's like, yeah, but you don't even understand the craziest thing about them, like, they all connect to each other. So if you put them all together, it's actually one big drawing, you know? And this other person that came to visit is like, no way. And I'm like, playing it off like it's true, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, this is not the case, you know? <laughs> but I was like, I'm gonna go back and start making this a real thing, because that's a great idea, you know? So I, <laughs> this was like 2007 or something, and I, and I no, maybe 2008, um, and I started to go back and, and make like ones to go in between, and it took me like a couple, like two years or a year and a half. Like it took me a long time, so I had a bunch of them at that point to actually go back. Some of them, I, this see, like the one there's a little skinnier, and that one's a little skinnier because some of them I, I I would half-ass it a little bit. I hate to admit it because I always try to make things like 100 percent, but well they are 100 percent. They're just not as wide. You know what I mean? But I would make them just like just to connect the two together, you know. And after 2008, or yeah, because I guess I finished that in 08. After that, I started to just make each one connect to the next one, each one connect to the next one. Okay. Then I came up with the idea, oh, because I grew up around Gettysburg, PA, and they have the famous cyclorama of the Battle of Gettysburg that you go into. Like back in the old days, this was a big form of entertainment, like before movies, where they would. The Battle of Gettysburg, and they set off flares, and you want, but it's a big circular room, and you walk around, and it tells you all about the battle. And it's like, oh my God, what if I made my whole life, my whole life long, I'll, I won't finish it until I die, and if I get the news, I'm gonna die soon or something, where it seems like, well, I'm just old enough, I should just tie it up and work on other stuff. But I wouldn't do it until I was really, you know, like, 40 years from now, at least, maybe 50, I don't know, but that I'd make a final one that would connect the last one to the first one, and it would make a big cycloramic image. And I was like, oh, I could get it to be like 800 feet or something if I did it long enough, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, that would be undeniable. I mean, who could deny that? Like, but it, it might be even be the biggest drawing, you know what I mean? If I did it my whole life, people would be like, it's the longest drawing anybody ever did. I mean, at least you'd get it in a record book, you know? Um, <laughs> so that's some of the thinking with that. So what do you connect them? Are you connecting the theme, the picture, the words? Both. So it's, it's all it's holistically connected. Yeah. What she okay. ask? And you have different uh, figures or different ideas that emerge in and out of the scrolls that change and adjust over time. Would you talk about some of the overarching, I guess, characters or themes or kind of what you're thinking about when you're working on a scroll? Yeah, those are um, a lot of stuff from philosophy and things that I read. I, I read a lot of nonfiction stuff and a lot of it's like philosophy and things like that. And um, I got into a lot of this stuff from, um, I guess a lot of it's like ancient Greek sort of, sort of stuff. I didn't do it intentionally, but I read a lot of that stuff and I figured it had an unconscious influence on me to do this approach where, where you know, they used to, in, in play to open up the philosophical debate, they would personify the abstractions with, with figures like deities in religious traditions, but they don't even necessarily have to be called a certain deity name. They would just be like, love says to reason, you know, and reason answers to love, and desire intervenes and says this. So a lot of it is like, based off that kind of like, approach, I think. Um, but then I like names too, I like coming up with fictional names, and I think names can say, give you a lot of certain feelings, so then I would start to name the different, you know, Entities or whatever, um, but a lot of it's a, a lot of it's more or less an excuse to um, riff about philosophical conundrums and um, you know all the, all the big issue stuff that people like to talk about when they talk about that type of thing. You know, time and matter and energy and you know whatever. Um, so there is writing 
in Lots those roles as well. Yeah. And so talk about the role that writing plays in your work. Um, well, there's a lot of writing in them, um, and it's philosophical slash poetic. Um, sometimes it's a little bit real life, but, but only if it pertains to the topic at hand and augments it. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes I'll start with the writing, sometimes the, I'll start with the drawing, and then the writing will suggest itself as it goes. And of course, now that I'm connecting them, I, I have to think about what came before a little bit. Um, usually not too much, but yeah. It's tricky because um, it's never ending. So when you know when you tell a story, it's like to be to make a movie or something. You need like, well, you know, what's the climax and how's where's the resolution? But if you don't intend there to be an ending until some unspecified point in the future, you sort of just have to say like, well, it's just kind of like a diary, you know, or something like that. So yeah, it's got a diary sort of quality to it, I guess. And at some point, you began using. Uh, inserting color into your work. So for many years, you worked in black and white. Can you talk a bit about the materials you use or the choice to start incorporating color? Yeah, well, I always I always worked in color, but not in these not in these ones. Um, and my reasoning for that was actually when I started doing it, I sometimes would go to um, Kinkos. Well, now they call it FedEx. I don't know what I'm <laughs> middle aged, but um, the, you'd go to Kinkos and they had the big blueprint machines, and I found out. Nobody ever used the blueprint machines that made zines or anything like that. It was off the radar of the punk rockers to use blueprint machines because why would you want to photocopy something that's like that wide? And I was like, I'm going to photocopy something that wide, you know? Um, so I, I was loading these big drawings into the blueprint machines and getting prints of them. And they didn't, it was on the honor system to pay for it. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, I guess these people that do blueprints, they're all like, you know, I was like, I'm going in at four in the morning and photocopying 20 of these things and like, you know, wait until they're not looking and waltzing out, you know? And I've got like, you know, 15 copies of them or something and the things that's big. And I would, I would sell them for $2 or $3, which, you know, at the time, of course, I couldn't sell them for that much money, you know? It was like prohibitively expensive to sell something for $3, you know? Um, but I would mail them to people and stuff like that. And But you couldn't reproduce them in color. Like if you put them through those machines and they were in color, it would look gray tone and it wouldn't look right. Um, so I was like, well, I'll just do them in black and white. And black and white's nice and stark and it looks real serious. And I want to make a really serious, you know, somber kind of like setting. So I kept with that black and white for a long time. And then eventually I was like, you know, why not? I don't have to make it copies of every one of them, and if I make copies, I can always just make a black and white copy for my own reference, because I have black and white copies of all of them at home in case I ever need to connect them all together and I lose one or sell one, because um, I was telling Allison I lost the first three at the post office, because um, I went to mail some to people one night, and I realized with horror as I walked out of the post office and the copies were in the mail, that I had left the originals on the table in the post office. This is back when they had the 24-hour post office, so it's like, again, it's probably like 4 in the morning. It's so always been a night owl, you know? And I ran back in there, and I'm like, oh my god, you know, and the guy working the night shift or whatever is like, well, I saw that, and I threw him away, I put him in the dumpster, and I'm like, well, you gotta get him back out the dumpster, you know? And he's like, no, I, we don't have access to it, you can't get access to it. And I had just gotten paid, or I had gotten money out of the bank, or something. I can't remember why, but I had a $100 bill on me, which was really, really unusual, but I had one, and I was like, look, I got a hundred dollar bill. I was like, I will give you a hundred dollars if you just take me to the dumpster and you find and he's like, No, I won't do it. Like he's like on principle. He's like, I'm gonna die on this hill. Like I will not like let you go through the dumpster. I'm like, this is an outrage. I started arguing with him. He's like, Well, I'm calling the police, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, You go ahead and call the police. I will and then I'm like, actually, don't call the police. <laughs> and so um, then I started to get scared. I'm like, all oh, these guys are gonna show up and it's four in the morning and all they know is this guy's calling them and being like, Yeah, some guys in here making trouble in the post office and I'm like, Oh, they're gonna be mad because they got bothered and they're gonna be thinking I've got a gun. I'm like, you know what, I'm just running out of here. So I beat a retreat and the guy, I, they told me I was banned from the post office. But <laughs> I had a PO box there and I went the next day and checked my mail and nobody knew what it was. So, you know, what happens at four in the morning doesn't, doesn't hold over until noon. You know? That's why you stay up at night. You know? <laughs> okay. So you're a musician, poet, visual artist, do you see these um, aspects as relating to one another, or how do you see them as relating? Yeah, they're all, I mean, it's all coming through me. You know, I don't like to think of so, like a big ego maniac, like, 
you know, it's my thing, but it's being like channeled through me somehow, so it's all got some, you know, residual imprint of my personality on it or something. Um, but, you know, I mean, what I can't draw, I write. What I can't write, I draw. And then there's some things you can't put into words and you can't draw them either, so maybe you could, you know, find some note, musical notes. Or I like playing the drums, and that's a different, you know, that's just kind of like repetitious rhythm to get in kind of a zone, you know. Um, yeah, I always think about that stuff because um, I never, I never learned meditation. I never, I never meditated that I knew of, that I know of, like not consciously. And every, every time I've tried it, it's been a dismal failure. You know, people are like, well, you just have to be really still. I'm like, that is horrible. Like, I, um, but I think that type of stuff probably. I think about like people that don't play the drums and they don't make art, they don't write, and they and maybe meditation is another thing you can do. I'm like, if you don't do any of those things, it's like no wonder people are clubbing each other over the head, like, you know, whatever. It's like, I don't know how nervous I'd be if I didn't do that stuff, you know what I mean? Because I get nervous, like, I'd be the most nervous person you ever met, you know, if I, if I couldn't, if I didn't do any of that stuff, so, you know. I will move on through these. Um, so you said that in addition, let's talk about some of your other nonfiction related projects. For example, the uh, Toynbee Tile documentary that you were featured in and your recent uh, publication about Herbert Crawley. Yeah, um, so I, I, I get into these. Um, my grandma, this is funny, my grandma said to my dad, um, my, my grandmother, my uh, maternal grandmother, still alive, and she, she said to my, my dad, like, a couple times ago, I was visiting them, you know, she, uh, this book had just actually gotten finished, you know. And, uh, I think I had given her a copy, or I was going to give her a copy, but anyway, she was like, saying to my dad, she's like, well, I'm not surprised Justin did this type of thing, because he's always been, um, how do you say it? How do you say it? What's the word I'm looking for? Oh, nosy. Um, <laughs> but my dad, he, he goes, okay, I think you mean curious. And she's like, oh, yeah, that's the word I was looking for, curious. That's right. I couldn't remember that word. Um, but that's, that's always been a you know, sort of facet of my personality is I've always been real um, nosy and curious about things, you know, like um, wanting to know about, you know, whatever really is going on, you know, and, and stuff like that. And so um, if something gets on my radar that I find interesting and then somebody says, yeah, nobody knows anything about it, you know, nobody knows where it came from, they probably never will, you know, then I'll get totally fixated on it and be like, I've got to figure out like, really where this thing came from or what its story is. And so the both of those things were projects born of that, you know, curiosity. Um, the Toynbee Tile movie was uh, these little placards in the street that they're made out of linoleum tile, and um, you know, this person would set them into the asphalt of a like crosswalk, like a mosaic tile, and then the cars drive over them, and the sun hits them, and they get embedded in the asphalt. And almost all of them that I ever saw in the mid-90s when I was working my foot courier job. They had this message on Toynbee Idea in movie 2001, Resurrect Dead on Planet Jupiter. Simple enough. Yeah. Um, so I would see these and walk over them, and I'd ask people about them, and people either would, would be like, I never saw it, and then the next day they'd be like, oh my god, it's real, I saw it. Or they would think they knew the answer, but it was obviously not true. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, so like at the anarchist bookstore, they're like, oh yeah, this anarchist guy that we know does them. You know, and it's like, well, why would you have a thing about Arnold Toynbee? And the, I mean, none of this stuff has anything to do with your like political outlook, or you know what I mean? It's not necessarily like opposed to it, but I don't know why. Anyway, um, so I got fixated on figuring that out, and I and I worked on it, and worked on it, and then my friend John went to a film school in Texas. He said, I want to make a film about this. Three years went by. He came back to Philly. He was like, I still want to do it. I was like, okay, I guess if you, you know. Three years have gone by, so he, he worked on making the film, and he's a perfectionist, like Kubrick, actually. And he, he worked on the film for six years or something. Uh, nobody believed he'd ever finish it. I mean, it was just like, yeah, sure, whatever, you know. But he's like, yeah, come over for another interview. Come over for that. I'm like, okay. And finally, he really did finish this thing. Um, he submitted it to a bunch of film fests that got rejected from all the film fests. And then the last day was the last day came up to submit to Sundance Film Festival, and he wasn't going to send it to him because he assumed it would be rejected. And his girlfriend said, "Why don't you don't want to live a life of regret? You should ride your bike down to the post office overnight. It'll get to him with four hours left for the deadline." So he put a DVD in there. He put his name and phone number, sent it to him, and unbelievably so, um, you know, they called him a couple 
weeks later at work or something. They're like, John, this is, you know, Stuart, you know, whatever the heck the guy name is from, from Sundance Film Festival. And so that was a crazy twist of luck and serendipity and everything else. Um, and, uh, and that went on to have a life where I believe, so if you look up on Netflix, oh my god, this is crazy. So it played in all these film festivals and stuff, and I was like, it's been seen by people, it's out there. Like, you know, so that was a crazy experience, but you know, like I got 2,000 bucks from it, and like, you know, it played in film festivals, and it was over, you know, it's like, okay, it's over. And then it went up on Netflix streaming, and that's the only time in my life that I had any kind of, like, slight tinge of what people talk about when they talk about, like, famousness or whatever, and it was like disturbing, like I was like, oh, like Netflix streaming, nothing matters but Netflix streaming, nobody sees a movie when it's in movie theaters, nobody sees a movie on anywhere until it's on Netflix streaming, I'm telling you, when I'm at Netflix streaming, I used to get like an email once a month from somebody that's like, oh, I saw your movie and I really enjoyed it, and like, I'd be like, oh, thanks, you know, whatever, I'm polite to people and stuff, and it went on Netflix streaming and it's like instantly like 30 emails every day, like, and I can't even keep up with them, like, I'm like, I can't answer all these emails, like, should I just make a form response, and it's like, thank you for your answer. So, uh, somebody sent me, like, nude pictures, I'm like, this is, like, inappropriate, like, it's like, like, the hell, like, you know what I mean, it's, like, getting, like, really scary, like, it's, like, you know, and then it went off Netflix streaming, and it stopped, you know, it's like, oh. but I figure, because I looked on Netflix and saw the number of reviews, and then I looked up somewhere, how many people review things on Netflix versus how many people watch it? You know what I mean? Like, how many people have to watch it before somebody actually takes the time to be like, customer review, this idiot wasted his life tracking down a bunch of stupid nonsense and then doesn't even find anything and he's a hipster moron, you know? Um, like, how many people have to watch it before somebody writes that? And it turns out it's like 200 people. And so I started to estimate it and I was like, I think over a million people have seen this. Like, I feel like over one, at least one million people have seen this freaking thing. And I'm like, it's crazy to think about that. Like, so that had its life. And then the Herbert Crowley book, in the end of the, this is getting too long-winded, right? I, okay, I'm trying to It's very interesting. Yeah, well, but you'll be like, my legs are cramping up. And I'm like, I'll still be here. Um, the Herbert Crowley book grew out of that, because in the end of the Toy Tell movie, I was already researching this artist, Herbert Crowley, who I liked a lot, but was his biography was like, nothing at all is known about Herbert Crowley whatsoever, period. You know? So I got really into, really into researching him, and then in the end of the Toy Tell movie, there's this little, like, where are they now thing, and it's like, Justin is researching the works of Herbert Crowley, and I was hoping that would like lead to something else, somebody that knew about Herbert Crowley, but it didn't. And then this local comics publisher in Philly happened to see the Toy Town movie in like 2014 or something, and was like, oh my god, I'm into Herbert Crowley, like what's this guy know about him? So he called me up and I was like, oh, you want to know about Herbert Crowley, you know? And we talked on the phone for like four hours, you know? Because um, I had already been like, had, had we been to Switzerland? Yeah. What's that? I don't know. I think we had already been to Switzerland. Me and Mandy went out to Switzerland. We were up to upstate New York and went through the... Anyway, I was like, I know everything about him. Like, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, by the time I got off the phone, he's like, we got to publish this book. We got to do a book. You know? So he does that crowdfunding stuff. He knows how to do that. And it went up on crowdfunding and did really well. That was another shock to me. I was really shocked by that. I thought it... I didn't think it would make its goal even let alone, like, I mean, I think the thing raised, like, a quarter million dollars on crowdfunding. I was like, what in the heck? Like, you know, I mean, it's got some tie-ins. Like, it's got the tie-ins to C.G. Young and the young <coughs> people really get excited about stuff that has to do with it. Like, I knew it would do okay, but, I mean, it really was unfathomable to me. So those were two. I do other stuff that didn't ever have as much success as those things, nonfiction things. But those are some nonfiction things I did that, that had some success. So. And then you also publish a zine. You started that maybe the mid 1990s also, and continue to publish it about once a year. I mentioned that we do have copies in the museum shop if you're interested in uh, looking at one. Do you want to say just a little bit about the zine before we open it up to some questions? Yeah, I started it in August '95. Um, I used to do it more often because before the internet, a zine was a way to be like, oh, I make art, and you know, and nobody's going to see it otherwise. So you make a zine and you know, distribute it haphazardly. However. It, um, but, you know, after the internet got so big and stuff, I just didn't, I never want to give up on things, so I was like, I'm going to make it forever, I'm not going to stop making it just because nobody wants to see it, you know, so, um, I, make, I make one about once a year, um, and it's just an amalgam of, like, 
I always put my art in it, and I put art of some of my friends, and I've been putting some of the nonfiction stuff I'm working on now in there, um, and stuff like that. But I started it in August 95, because uh, this friend of mine was like, well, he wanted me to go to the Wildwood Boardwalk and like party with him and his friends, and I didn't want to do that at all. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen that movie Birdie. Anybody ever see that movie Birdie? I mean, it's not a movie anybody sees, but... <laughs> If you ever do see it, if you're like, I'm going to go see Birdie now, because Justin mentioned this movie Birdie, you know, you'll laugh in, in retrospect. When you're watching it later, you'll laugh, because you'll be like, now I see what he's talking about. This guy, who plays the guy? Martin Scorsese? Uh -huh. Who plays well, the, who plays Al? Nick Cage, Nick, what's his name? Nicholas, Nicholas Cage? Cage? Yeah. Who? Cage. Nick, Nicholas Cage? Nicholas Cage? Yeah. Okay. I don't never know people in movies, I just know the characters, but anyway, I guess Nicolas Cage is the b buddy whose name's Al, which is really funny because my friend's name was Al too, although we ca everybody called him Butch, and he was like, well still is, but he's like super macho, you know what I mean, this buddy of mine, Al, and so is Al in the movie, which is funny, but he's kind of like, I don't know, I was telling you, or somebody earlier, those guys were buddies with those guys that did that thing Jackass in the 90s or whatever, so that's how their personality types were, they were like these friends of mine that were like, dude, like, you know, let's like set our arms on fire and jump off of like a moving car and you know try to videotape it. Except unlike the guys who did Jackass, they weren't good at it. Like <laughs> you know, those guys would like c complete the rolling off of the cab and stuff, and it got on TV. Whereas like you know, my buddy Al was just like, ah, I just burned my arm and like I didn't, I didn't fall off the moving car and I just got arrested and beat up. You know? Um, but anyway, he was like, let's go to the Wildwood Boardwalk and we're going to party. You know, the Wildwood Boardwalk is crazy. And this was in 95. I was still like homeless. I had like body lice and stuff. I was like cringing at the idea of going to the Wildwood Boardwalk. I said, we need girls. You know, I'm like, oh God, like kill me. You know what I mean? So he's like, well, listen, dude. He's like, you do that. You, do, you write poetry and you do art and stuff. He's like, why don't you make a zine? And I have this friend in, in Jersey who works at a Kinko's, and on the way down to the Wildwood Boardwalk, we'll stop, and she'll copy as many copies of your zine as, as you want. And then on the Wildwood Boardwalk, you can like give people your zine. Like, are you happy now? You know what I mean? That, did I placate your like, art zine? I'm like, yes, you did. Let's do this. <laughs> so we went to the Kinko's, and that's how, that was the first issue of my zine, Decades of Confusion number one, August 95. And as a joke, I put on the cover $70. I was like, oh, I'm just going to make it say $70 as a tongue-in-cheek thing. And I walked around the boardwalk and I sold 200 copies for a dollar a piece because everybody's drunk. And I would just walk up to them and be like, hey, buy my zine. They're like, what is a, what is a, what are here's a dollar, you know. And I sold all of them. I couldn't believe it. Um, and I saw a bunch of them in the trash then. You know, I'm like going to get funnel cake and you see like a pile of them in the trash because everybody buy them and they'd be like, what is this? What the, what did I do? Throw them away. I got one pen pal from that who was like, you know, one, some, some genuinely artsy teenage, fellow teenager from Wildwood who was like, wow, I really like it. And I wrote to her for a couple years, and I don't know whatever happened to her. But that was the genesis of the zine, and I just kept doing it after that. Um, yeah. Well, any uh, questions? Oh, oh. <laughs> so, so Justin, do you, do you feel comfortable with it being put in, because I don't know how to say it, do you consider yourself an outsider artist? Is that a bucket you feel comfortable in? Yeah, I'm into it, you know, and, and I'll tell you why, because um, I feel like uh, I've, I've seen a lot of this stuff, um, well, you see a lot of that, you know, where people are like, oh, is it condescending, or is it insulting, or something like that, and I, I can get how it can seem that way, because you're like, oh, you know, like, but I'm, I like it, because, and, and the reason why is because, um, you know, I, I do see, like, you know, I've got a lot of that, like, privilege, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, straight white guy, you know, like, whatever, you know, and that's all real, but, like, I do see this stuff of, like, um, class inequality and education inequality. So I've got, like, no education to speak of, you know what I mean? I got self-education in my 10th grade, you know, whatever. Um, and, and, you know, my, my background with money is, is about as low as you could come <laughs> Not Well, my parents now are, they're doing better because they don't have kids, but now at home, but, um, you know. <laughs> Um, I think I think it's a good thing in that way where it gives people some, you know, because because the because the people that get to, um, you know, are afforded opportunity to go to school and stuff. You know, you make connections, you meet people in school, and then you have some kind of like in to like potentially, you know, not always, but um, you know, it, it gives you more of an in. And I feel like the outsider art 
label or whatever, it's a way to give like a, a little bit of a leg up or a little bit of an end to people that don't have that. You know what I mean? Because it's like, why not have something for people that are like, well, I've got no, like I do a resume or something and I'm like, I've got nothing to put on this thing. Like it's like, I mean, I did some things that were successful and I did some things that I think are cool, but I can't put anything on there that's like, this is my education, this is, you know what I mean? So I think it's, I think it's kind of cool that there's something that's evolved kind of organically over time, you know, to give some kind of category to that, you know, whatever doesn't fit into the rest of the, you know what I mean? Well, your art looks great at the end of it, so. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I saw the Toynbee title movie a few years ago, but it didn't, until you mentioned it, I didn't connect you as the guy. Okay, all right, right. So that's a big shot. Okay. okay. <laughs> a lot of people here probably don't know what we're talking about with the toy retail, but I was in New York recently, like a year ago, mm -hmm. and I saw toy retails in Manhattan. And the year before that, I saw three or four of them. Yeah, it yeah. can't be the same guy, right? It's the same guy. Yeah. He's, He's around. still out there He's still going out. out. Yeah. 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 Is there only one guy? You sure well, there's one original guy, but since even before the movie came out, actually, since like the movie came out in 2011, since 2005, there's been at least one really prolific, really high quality tile making group uh, based in um, uh, what is that, Mandy, up in uh, House of Petty, Buffalo, New York. Yeah, Buffalo, and um, and they've been doing their own type of tiles that are just amazing. But they've only done a few that are really like knockoff, copycat, Twinbee ones. Most of the Toynbee ones are really the same guy. The guy is still alive. A lot of people erroneously think he died because he's a junior. So Sibby Verna mm -hmm. Sr. died. So people Google him and they're like, oh, the guy died, which I'm thankful for because I'm like, I think the guy in peace. You know what I mean? Like, I'm always kind of like, whatever, because I know he's like a paranoid, you know what I mean? But since, okay, so since the conclusion of the movie, so to the, have you had any more contact with him? No, see, I never tried to you, because you, you want to leave it alone. The ending of that movie is true. Like that's a legitimate thing. Like I, I really did feel that way. Like a, you know, I was just kind of like, you know, I mean, this guy is like his main thing is he's paranoid. You know what I mean? It's like, and I'm just thinking to myself, we're making his paranoia real. Like all of a sudden, there really are people like following him around and stuff. You know what I mean? So <laughs> exactly. I just thought like. Okay, but I didn't know that before we figured that out. Up until that point, I was like, I don't know, maybe he wants to like, maybe if we like figure out the right way to contact him, he'll be like, oh, I'm happy to talk to you, you know, I'm like, um, but it, he's, you know what's funny with him though? People don't even realize this stuff and it's so funny if things aren't like, we, we have the archipelago of apps that like, if it's not on like, you know, YouTube or Facebook or them, it's like it didn't even happen, you know what I mean? But he's been taking out these ads. He's been, he's been, he got in an ad. I shouldn't know, whatever. He got, some, he got some money from, a fan, uh, I believe it was his sister passed away. And of course it's him, so what's he do with the money? He takes all the money and he's been spending this money on taking out radio ads in Philly. So like the local Philly rock station, like the classic rock station, you know? WMMR rocks, everything that rocks, you know? And it's like, not everything that rocks, you know, it's like, 20% of stuff that rocks and like... 8% of them. Yeah, and plus a lot of it doesn't even rock. I'm from You're like, this just blows yeah. it doesn't even rock. You know? um, but anyways, um, he's been taking out like ads on MMR and I'll be at work and those guys listen to MMR and like an ad will come on where it's like, you know, like like Rush or whatever will go off and then this ad will come on where it's like, Tony B's idea in movie 2001. And everybody thinks it's like a joke that like, they're like, oh, it must be Preston and Steve that do the morning, the, the morning Howard, S, uh, Howard Stern S type show that, because they did an interview with me and John about the Toynbee movie and stuff. They're, people are like, they think it's a joke, or they think, and I'm like, no, it's really him. He, he bought these ads. Like, How old is the guy now? I'm not sure off the top of my head. I'm going to say probably like the late 70s or something at this point, but I'm not totally sure. Um, you could get on ancestry.com or something. Whatever. And then, uh, I think we have a. Did, uh, oh, right, right there, right. I, I may, I'm, I'm hard of hearing and I may have missed something, but just in case, the, the picture on the left with all the tiles, that was the top, not this, but before, that okay. was the Toynbee tiles. What was the one, that, the silence thing? Is that the same book? No, that, well, this one is a film. So the one on the left is a documentary film, um, and that's the cover of it, um, or like what you put on the poster of the film. And the one on the right is a book, um, yeah. About the toy book? <laughs> no, it's about this artist Herbert Crowley, who I was just another nonfiction project that I got really into researching. And, 
Oh, but you didn't do that art, and that no, that art on the cover of that book is Herbert Crowley's work. You didn't, you didn't talk as much about your art as I would have liked. I mean, you got into the tiles, and then you stopped okay. talking about the I'm art. I'm long-winded. I just <laughs> <laughs> the, you stopped actually with color. You didn't even tell us how you started reproducing with the color, because the last we heard was a blueprint, and you couldn't do color. Oh yeah, I didn't reproduce the ones that are in color. Not in color, anyway. So just there's just those originals that we're seeing that yes. haven't been reproduced. Yes, in color, yeah. And I those are the originals. I think well, they're on, phenomenal. Reproduced in black and white. Oh, all of the color ones, I've done black and white copies of them, but they're in black and white, so it's gray tone. Yeah. But your color work is phenomenal, thank I you. think. Yeah, I try. Mm -hmm. I put all my effort into it. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. So in the Guardian Sisters of Womb at Calm, and I uh, forget the rest of the title, but in that one there's this owl figure with like the tentacle arms, and there's a woman below her with there's a mirror. You have to have to. I remember it pretty much, I think. And so I just was seeing, I just was seeing a lot of like connections to the idea of Eve in the garden and Lilith. Yeah. And maybe. Because the night owl in, is a symbol of that kind of platonic female energy and the snake with the tentacles as well, and then especially the mirror. Yeah. And I was just wondering, like, how, if that was running through your mind when you were doing that, or what, um, what connections you're drawing to, like, yeah. those older art motifs. And well, I grew up, um, I didn't grow up in a religious household, but my maternal grandfather, his side of the family, was pretty seriously religious, although they were Church of the Brethren, which is a pretty progressive Christian church, so they're, they're not exactly, they're not as extreme as the Quakers or whatever, but like they say, well, you can drive a car, but it has to be like, you can only have a black car, you know, you can't have like a red car, whatever. But they're pacifists and um, stuff like that, and my grandfather was a particularly progressive, you know, member even of that denomination. So I grew up with some influence of that Christian, you know, worldview and stuff like that. We used to deliver plants to all the different churches when I was a kid. So I got to see the Seventh-day Adventists and I got to see the Catholic Church and all that stuff. And it left a big impression on me. And when I was a kid, I decided, actually my dad gave me this idea because he was like, oh, you know the thing with that religious stuff, they take everything out of context. You know, they'll take one sentence and then they they talk about it for an hour and a half, but he's like, nobody just reads it. So I was like, I'm gonna read it. So when I was a kid, I read the, the you know, the canonical Bible, you know, um, as, as it is, you know, that I could find easy when, in that time and place from, I just read it, you know, I was like, I'm gonna read it, you know, and it left a big impression on me. So I get, some not consciously, but I think just like as part of my, you know, cultural whatever, upbringing or whatever, I get some of that stuff. But of course, when I got older, I started to get curious about the history of that stuff. You know, how did how did um, the 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 Roman the Roman Empire, you know, Christianity became the official state religion, and what changed then, and what was it like before then? And I started to get curious about that stuff because I grew up with that stuff. So, you know, I started to delve into this stuff um, with the Gnostic stuff and Plato, and you know, all the stuff that was in the air. Um, when that stuff was still being figured out, you know, when they were actually like, what should we put in, what should we keep out, and who's a heretic and who isn't. So I know about the stuff you're talking about. Um, some of it might have been quasi-intentional, and some of it was probably just bouncing around in my head ambiently. But um, but yeah, I, I, I think you're on to something there. <laughs> um, so... Yeah. And this one is actually interesting. It does show some of the influences that you've been reading as well. You mentioned, for example, there's a figure uh, related to, I guess, uh, Stalin. Yeah. And some of the what you were uh, thinking about at the time. That would be the figure, the sort of mustached figure in the bottom, uh, kind of bottom center. Yeah, with the, like the scimitar. You know. <laughs> yeah, I was reading a biography of Joseph Stalin at the time. And you know, that influence still, you know, kind of ambiently melded into the story, you know, um, as a character, you know, so. And yeah. so I guess, what influences from your life do you find frequently, or how does your lived life sort of impact your art, or have you 
looking back on the work that you've created, have you been able to have any observations about uh, kind of where you were at different places or anything of uh, particular note or interest? Yeah, a lot of it's materials because a lot of the artwork is um, shaped by the materials I'm using. So a lot of it was like, well, what art materials were available at the time? I mean, I started going the black marker drawings because that gas station around the hotel had markers. I never really messed with markers before that, you know? Um, but drawing that big marker drawing on the wall, I was like, oh, markers are the thing, the way to go. I mean, because I like tight black and white line work. Interestingly, I found out I was influenced by this wood carving artist, Fritz Eichenberg, who, who was a really great artist, and I didn't even know I was influenced by him because I got him one step removed from the world of skateboarding. Because when I was a kid, like kids tend to do, you know, I, I, I thought skateboarding was cool. I wasn't any good at it, but I was like, thought it was cool. So I'd look at the magazines and see the artwork and stuff. And the artist that I really, really loved who made skateboard artwork was one of the ones that you never hear about, uh, Vincent Cortland Johnson. Because Vincent Cortland Johnson was more of a reclusive character. He didn't seek a bunch of attention like some of the other skateboard artists did. And he wasn't a skateboarder. He was from an older generation. He was from the 60s generation. Um, but I loved his art, and you could never even find out his name. I remember looking at those drawings and being like, who even is this person? Like, you know, and with the, he, I don't know if any of you are familiar, but he did the famous one with the skull gripping the snake in its teeth, and you see the scales of the snake, like, glowing up, like, it's really... Mike Miguel. Mike Miguel. Yeah, the Mike, yeah, right, right. He did that. That was one of his, that was one of his, his graphics, you know. And, and, of course, the Caballero Dragon, he did that. But you can't find much about him. But I finally found recently, there was like a rare, it's like rare as hen's teeth, um, video interview with him. And it's fascinating, because it's like one of the skateboarders goes to his like cabin in the woods, you know, and he's like, they have to come to me in person, I'm not gonna do this stuff over the phone, you know, like, they, there's like a spiritual component to skateboarding, and like, you know, I'm like, this guy is like, on, like, on the wavelength, it's like, like, I knew it as a kid, I knew it, you know, it's like, I love that there's something about this that really speaks to me, you know, it's like cold in a way that I really liked, you know, um, and uh, he brings up, because people would always say, oh, I see this wood carving, and I'm like, no, there's no wood carving stuff in there, but then, wouldn't you know Vincent Cortland Johnson at some point, because I used to draw with quill pens when I was like 12, 11, 12, I'd get quill pens and dip them in the little inks and just try to do really tight lines. I'd trace my hand and try to draw my fingerprints, that type of thing, you know? Because I, I was good at it and it felt good to do it, you know? And he says this thing in his interview, he's like, oh, you know, but I owe this huge debt to, to uh, Fritz Eichenberg. You know, like, I just, like, Fritz Eichenberg was my, and I was like, oh, I got, and I was like, oh my God, there it is, it's like, one step removed, you know, because Eichenberg was this wood carving, you know, he was this amazing, incredible wood carving artist, and it turns out Vincent Cortland Johnson was really heavily influenced by him, and then uh, he had an influence, I was like, wow, this is like, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yes. um, so then, I was just kind of thinking about how you mentioned Gnosticism, and like, really looking at all this documentation of different things, a lot of that is really like, very intentional, like very regimentally intentional in terms of like sacred shapes and numerology and even like acting out what you're doing. So I was wondering if that plays into your technique at all with art or if you're really more focused on that intuitive flow um, of art making. It doesn't play into the technique as an influence from that philosophy. In other words, it's not, it isn't something where it was like I read or heard about um, you know, a sect or, um, you know, belief system or whatever philosophy of the past that had a certain approach and then after finding that out decided to apply that approach to my work. But um, I do apply that stuff for sure as far as just like doing, there's tons of stuff in there, if you, you'll catch it if you look for it, where it's like, oh, I have to do something a certain number of times and then that correlates to another piece. And, but I think that's just something that humans have always always done. And, and, you know, I think that when people, you know, want to make something that seems special or sacred or magical or, you know, you want to you put something in there that's somewhat veiled or a little bit, you know what I mean? Not so obvious, but if you, if you really pay attention to it, then you can find, oh, there's a correlation with the, you know what I mean? Like you say, like the number of times something is done yeah, 
So yeah, there, there is stuff like that in there, but it's but like I say, it's not it's not drawn from that specific source. Any any uh, final questions? One is how long does it take you to do one of your pieces? Well, I'll give you two answers to that, <laughs> and they won't be too long, I promise. <laughs> A um, an art collector in Philly one time, who I met in Philly. I don't know if he was from Philly. I think he was from he lived out in the suburbs, but. Um, there was, a, there was a big to-do about, you know, what happens if you meet this guy and stuff. And, and he didn't say much to me, but he said, um, I loved it because he addressed me as son. He said, son, how long does it take you to do one of these? You know, I, I, don't, I just was caught off guard by it. I was like, I'm not sure because it varies, you know, whatever. And he, said, he says, that's a good answer. You'll get more money. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my first answer. And I ought to stop there, but I, um, I talk too much, so I have to give you also the true answer. Um, which is that it does vary a lot um, depending on what takes me away from the art, you know, like what else I have going on in my life. But if I really am like, okay, nothing else is going on, you know, everybody's away on vacation, I'm alone, there's no like work requirements on me, there's no whatever. I mean, I think I could rock one out in a month, you know, if I really was like, okay, it's like 10 hours a day, you know, taking a break for lunch. Uh, but they usually take more like, three or four months. And it's the same for the big ones as the small ones, which is funny. Those ones that are about that big take the same amount of time as the ones that are like this big. Because <laughs> I'm using small pens for the, you know. Um, yeah, these are the small pens, so they take about the same amount of time, you know. And uh, adding to that, you also keep track of the music you're listening to when oh, you're yeah. working on uh, the scrolls also? Yeah. Um, that's a way I could almost time it because I listen to music on my headphones when I when I work on the art. I always write down what I listen to and what order I listen to it in and the date that I listen to it to keep like a log. So I have all these log books where it's like, you know, May 25th, 2015, and then it has all of the, you know, pieces of music I listen to. And then I put how many songs or individual pieces of music is on each one of those. So I'll put a little parentheses and it'll, you know what I mean? So. Um, so that's another way I could keep track of it, although some of the pieces of music are 10 minutes long and others are 30 seconds. So I aver if I average it at four minutes per like piece of music, it comes out to about a month of 10 hours a day. You know? <laughs> I did it one time, it's that curious. <laughs> well, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Justin, yeah, uh, thank for, you. for uh, uh, being here today. I so much to see and to read, so uh, Justin will be around for a bit after to maybe answer any other questions you might have, but uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.